New America would like to welcome you to our virtual event. The program will begin momentarily. While we are waiting, I want to review a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded, and a recording will be posted to the New America events page within 48 hours after the event. Attendees will be in listen-only mode, and you will not be able to be seen or heard by your fellow attendees or panelists. Therefore, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the Slido box located to the right of the video. Closed captioning is available by hovering over the video and clicking CC at the bottom of the video. If you encounter any issues during the event, please contact events at newamerica.org. Thank you for joining us. We will begin momentarily. All right. Thank you very much. I, I can't top that voice. Um, I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program here at New America, and I'm just going to welcome you and say a little bit about uh, what we're what we're doing here. Um, for the last year plus, um, we've been part of, I think, a community uh, of organizations and activists looking at the concept of co-governance. And really, the question is, is there a way for activists and organizers to have a relationship with government that's not always adversarial, where they're, we're kind of working together to um, to get problems uh, solved and, and make sure that the that the public voice is heard. And uh, in the course of this, we found a lot of really fascinating examples of it. Uh, and we there's really kind of a, a community of organizations that have been working on it. It includes New America, my colleague, Holly Russell Dillman, who you'll hear from later, The Forge Organizing, which is a, a publication about organizing, one of the, you know, one of the most fascinating uh, publications that's come along recently and has done a special issue about co-governance, um, local progress, the State Innovation Network and other State Innovation Exchange uh, and and other groups and, and also some some key funders. Kevin Simowitz uh, is, is, has really been a key uh, driver in helping us think about these issues, um, along with the Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation, foundations and um, Democracy Fund have been helpful in, in building this. So I think this event is part of uh, that process of kind of building a community of, of shared understanding of what this concept is, what its potential is, what the pitfalls are, what people's experiences are. Um, so we're gonna just have uh, real interaction with people who've, who've, who are practitioners of this kind of co-governance. Um, uh, starting with um, uh, Helen Gim, who's a member of the Philadelphia City Council, uh, Gail Johnson, who's a former uh, city commissioner in Gainesville, Florida, uh, Jesse Ulibari, who's a uh, co-executive director of the State Innovation Exchange and a uh, former elected official himself, and Crystal Zermeno, who uh, is the strategy director of the Texas Organizing Project. Uh, in conversation with Sarah Johnson from Local Progress and Holly Rosen Gilman, who I mentioned before, who's my colleague at, at New America. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, in addition to this conversation, take a look at the uh, issue of the forge devoted to this and the, and the report that we recently put out with um, with a number of case studies of our own that I think are, are, are all really fascinating. Um, so with that, I think I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Guernsey from, from Open Society Foundation, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to New America, The Forge, and Local Progress for putting together this exciting event um, and for the important work on co-governance that is really transforming how we contest for power and empower people to make change that affects their lives. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a senior program officer at the Open Society Foundations, and part of our strategy around building a multiracial democracy focuses on moving progressive policy at the state and local level with a focus on co-governance and changing who serves in public office. We have some of the smartest, most inspiring leaders on this call today. And I think the recent Forge publication and the New America case studies really show the brilliance of how public sector leaders are working with organizers and advocates in their community to change what we think is possible and who government is for and by. Today, we're bringing together participants from the case studies and contributors to the FORGE issue to talk about new frontiers and collaborative governments, what inside-outside strategy really looks like in practice, and what it takes to build real governing power. 
I am super, super grateful to be here and to learn from this amazing group of leaders. Um, and now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to turn it over to Sarah Johnson of Local Progress. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, so I think Holly and I have the pleasure of co-facilitating this conversation. Um, and I'm going to get us started off with a couple questions um, for our incredible panelists. Um, I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm the executive director of Local Progress, which is a network of uh, nearly 1,300 local elected officials, city, county, school board uh, across the country working collectively to advance racial and economic justice. Um, and so grateful to be joined by Helen, uh, our board co-chair, Gail, one of our former members, uh, Crystal, at uh, one of our incredible partners for our work in Texas, uh, and Jesse, uh, who is like my, uh, I don't know, like corollary counterpart uh, and partner in all things um, at the State Innovation Exchange. So, um, and, you know, I'm just personally so excited for this conversation. I come out of labor organizing, moved into movement politics, and have transitioned um, through my work at Local Progress into really thinking about governance and governing. Um, and really just I'm always grounded in that diversity of experiences and really trying to think about what do we actually mean when we say building the power to control um, our future, right, to control the largest and most impactful uh, structures that we have for democratic participation. So um, I'm super personally excited to be here. And I think as we just dive into this conversation, I want to start by taking a little bit of a step back. Collaborative governance is not really a concept or practice that's widely understood. I bet many of the people joining us today are like, huh, I wonder what they mean about that. Um, and if you look at the diversity of voices in the FORGE issue and in the incredible case studies that New America pulled together, it's actually a complicated and multifaceted concept with lots of different elements to it. So there isn't one simple or really singular definition. Um, so we want to start this conversation by grounding in the incredible experience that our panelists are bringing um, from Pennsylvania, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and nationally, um, and start this conversation by just asking everybody, or starting with a definition of what collaborative governance means to our panelists and sharing a story of what it looks like in action. Um, so I'm going to ask Helen and Crystal to um, jump in first on this question. And then Jesse and Gail, you can kind of add in if you've got things to add from your own experience. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Helen Kim. Sorry for my voice. I'm still recovering from a little bit of a cold, um, but it's wonderful to join Sarah and um, Gail and um, Crystal and Jesse, of course, on a really important discussion about collaborative governance. I'm Helen Kim. I'm a city council member in Philadelphia, proud co-chair of Local Progress. For me, collaborative governance um, is so much about uh, a process, a practice, and the amount of work. Um, for those of us who represent communities who are often on the margins of public policy or ones that are oppressed or neglected by it, um, our work is to build power and to recognize that um, the systems that oppress, marginalize, and um, push people out of places of self-determination and visibility are all around and collaborative governance um, pulls together different forces to alter the trajectory of how people think government currently operates. It alters the mindset of people who practice government inside um, as well as outside. And it reallocates, uh, it needs to reallocate resources towards that. So when you think about the work that needs to go in, to say changing an agency's mission or expanding an agency's mission to cover an area that has not currently existed or to drive resources towards an area that has long been neglected. You realize that actually what you need is not just simply people talking inside and outside of government. You actually need to build a strong collaborative um, mission driven force that is working both inside the government institutions and utilizing um, voices, 
uh, stories, information, and pressure externally. This is uh, what I would say um, would be one example of that. Um, you know, Philadelphia is the fourth highest evicting city in the nation. We processed almost 22,000 evictions every single year without batting an eye. When I first came in, I knew that evictions impacted 74% uh, targeted a black tenant, 70% involved a woman, and over half involved a caregiver. But the way that evictions are traditionally seen in Philadelphia, it's a contractual disagreement um, when uh, a tenant uh, fails to pay or breaks the lease with a with with a landlord, and that this was a contractual issue between two parties, um, which are outside the scope of government. It's not a public policy issue. It's sort of something that's legislated through municipal courts. Um, and so we really needed to change the mindset of that. You know, we first started out uh, with not having that many resources. We didn't have housing subsidies, local rent vouchers or anything like that. We started out by building out a table with, um, you know, uh, an anti-eviction task force. Um, we start out by building bridges with our communities. Um, we understand that in these, uh, task forces, we are looking for places of strength, um, oftentimes in local government and especially with communities on the margins. Uh, we're told what we can't do, what we don't have the power for, and that the forces against us are overwhelming. Um, and what we never have, ch have the chance to do through collaborative governance is figure out what our strengths are, the strengths that are unpredictable, the things that are untapped and relationships that are un, um, underutilized. And so um, through the anti-eviction task force, we launched a tenant legal defense fund. Then we worked on a right to counsel mission. And when the COVID pandemic hit, we were now in full partnership with our courts, um, working together to see uh, an eviction moratorium go through and then a diversion program um, that's seen and led to a drop off um, in evictions by 75% um, for two years in a row. Um, none of this happens by accident. None of this happens without a purposeful force of people pulling together and altering how we look at one another and also what the possibilities are as we face impossible circumstances. Um, so that is just a quick window in and happy to talk about it more. I guess I can jump right in. Uh, Crystal said many of Texas organizing project and it's just really awesome to be here um, with these great leaders doing really innovative work and making real changes for our communities across the country. Um, I think for us, uh, we are community organization in Texas, in multiple cities, doing work at the city level, at the county level, at the school district level. We're a member-based organization in Black and Latino communities across the state. And, you know, collaborative governance is having an authentic seat at the table where real decisions are made. So not, you know, not these sort of commissions, but really like in with government, sitting around and having real discussions, sharing our stories and making sure that it's not just the organization that's at the table, but it's actually those folks that are our membership that are directly impacted from our communities, actively participating in governance. So they're informing policy. Helen, it was great to hear you say, like telling those stories so that folks really from the get understand what those priorities are and like, and what people, really everyday lives look like. Um, and so, and, and I think one of the things that has been critically important is getting tapped along the way, right? So I just, I wanna give an example that Judge Lena Hidalgo, who is actually not a judge, but is the top county executive in Harris County where the city of Houston is situated. Um, when she came in, in her administration, she immediately put resources behind these listening sessions to really inform her priorities, to hear the stories. There were sessions across the city, different subject matters, was very uh, committed to outreaching to all of the grassroots organizations and service organizations and having real diversity at all of these tables. And then 
really taking that to to decide where she was going to resource priorities and then putting real resources behind that, behind the different tables that needed to to be formed. Um, And I think one of the other critical things that often we are not prepared for as organizations is when we win governing power and get those progressive leaders elected, having our people in that administration. And she was very committed to reaching back out, figuring out who those hires could be, who was willing to step away from organizations and step into the administration and take on those roles. And what's most important is that it's the everyday things that really, I think, make the difference in co-governance. So it's not just the boards, it's not just the commission hearings, it's not just these special meetings, it's picking up the phone and asking our opinions. It's picking up the phone when we call, having real staff connections and sitting down and building strategy and priorities, having a similar power map of the dynamic. If there's a policy that we really need change from the community, collaborating together on what does that strategy and pathway look like for victory for our folks. Um, And so I think those are some real critical things that have made a difference and that I think we've evolved in as community organizations to really recognize we are allies and we can text and we can call and that's okay and that works. Uh, So that's that's what that's the approach that we've been um, really taking in Texas. That's great. And I think we've got a couple more minutes on this question, Jesse or Gail, if either of you want to hop in and share anything. Yeah, I, I would love to hop in. Um, yeah, I'm really thrilled to be here with you all today. Thank you for having this. Um, you know, really simply put, I think that collaborative governance means that regular everyday folks are at the front and center of making decisions about their own communities. And I think there's a really important piece of this puzzle that we need to acknowledge, and that's about making sure that we are making it easy as possible and accessible as possible for people to be able to make those kinds of decisions. So to me, it's like community engagement 2.0, but with the added piece that whatever kind of community engagement we do and whatever comes and stems, what what comes from the community is actually being implemented in the communities. Um, You know, and when I say meeting people where they are, Crystal, like you mentioned about, you know, the listening sessions, that's one really important part piece of piece of it. But also, I think in government, we've gotten really used to either having town halls or, um, you know, or having a a virtual town hall or having a community meeting and like at a, you know, at a church or a faith space. But we aren't really doing the, the work and the deep listening and the meeting people where they are, meaning things like you know, getting on TikTok and getting into Discord and getting into the signal chats and making and and getting, you know, meeting folks at the grocery store, making sure that we're, you know, talking to people when they're picking up their kids from daycare. Like that is something that I was always pushing in um, in government is making sure that we are truly meeting people where they are and not checking a box um, when we said that we were doing community engagement and helping and helping people to help us make decisions. A really good um, example of this that we implemented uh, in Gainesville, I thought of it as kind of like reverse consulting. Um, And that to me meant like all of you all understand how much money (laughs) we spend on consultants, hundreds and thousands of dollars on consultants every year to pay these experts to come and extract information from our communities and then repackage it and they give it to us, you know, the, the officials to say, this is what we came up with, you know, and we happily paid that money to do that. Well, I said to myself, these, this money and these, these people that are giving freely of their time and energy, why don't we pay regular community folks? Because they are the experts on their own communities to go in and do that. We, you know, I called it reverse consulting. We rebranded it as community cultivators, but we literally paid people in the community to go and talk to other people and get that information, which one again, once again, this, these are trusted people, right? Um, so you're more likely to get the real good information that's going to help inform your policies. And then we did that. And that, um, that that's, that's a program that I'm hoping we're going to be expanding. We did that with our comprehensive plan update. Um, but that was something I was really passionate about is that we were paying people, like you said, Helen, 
the reallocation of resources, right? So we reallocated resources from, you know, these consulting companies and then put that money directly back to the hands of the communities with at the same time being able to get the information that we needed to inform our policy decisions. That's great. Thank you, Gail. Uh, so hearing themes of radical inclusion, um, of centering decision making, um, and kind of clarifying kind of roles and what people are really being brought into. And then, you know, also want to just like interwoven around what everybody said. There was a lot that was just actually about the complexity of governing, right? We tend to think a lot about policy and legislative campaigns, but people talked about budgets, staffing, workforce development, contracting powers of cities, um, among other things. And, um, you know, I think we like when we think about change, it actually requires change across all of these different facets. You don't just get to pick one. And that is the complexity of really trying to figure out the strategies that, as Helen said, like unleash the strengths that um, different parts of coalitions bring with different experiences. So just kind of wanted to lift that up. So the second question I want to ask, and Jesse, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to go to you first on this one, um, is really about building power. So the title of this uh, session is not just like collaboration because it makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside and it's a good human behavior, um, but it is actually about collaboration explicitly for the purpose of building power. Um, so, you know, if we are really thinking about governing power as not just the ability to be heard and not just the ability to move our ideas, but actually control a seat at the table of the structures and processes that shape the agenda setting and decision making within the institution of government. I think everybody on this panel would probably agree we are not really holding it <laughs> probably almost anywhere in that fully embodied sort of like idea. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the how we get there. Um, how does deepening inside and outside collaboration in the ways that folks have talked about in these examples help us build power? And what are its limitations as a power building tool? Um, so I'll turn it over first to Jesse, um, and then we can open it up for our other panelists. Thanks, Sarah. And wanna just, again, thank the organizers of this event. And I'm always inspired to hear Sarah um, dream out loud, which is something I get to do pretty frequently, thankfully, and to hear Helen and Gail and Crystal talk about their experiences. Again, my name is Jesse Ulibarri. I'm the co-executive director of the State Innovation Exchange. And we're a network of state legislators moving bold progressive policy across the country. And I come to this work as an organizer myself and had the great privilege of representing the area I grew up in, including the trailer park where I spent my earliest years of life. And so when we think about the path to governing power, it is one both in my bones as an organizer of having been on the outside organizing issue campaigns, voter registration efforts, building political power, and also the exercise of power once I was elected to turn many of the policies I had fought for on the outside into law when I became a legislator. And so this is not you know, esoteric or academic for me. I think there are three essential components about the path to um, collaborative governance that are central to our work. And that is refocus, recommit, and reimagine. And I really wanna dig in on each of these. When I say refocus, I wanna like shout out the amazing work and uh, visionary thought leadership I've heard in the abolition movement, which is this dominance over frame, this punishment and dismiss frame doesn't serve any of us. And unfortunately it shows up in our politics everywhere it's baked in. Uh, and what that means is that we have a view of power, which is power over, power to harm, power to do, but not power with. And so when I say refocus, there has to be a shift within our collective movements towards power with. What does it look like to hold and share power together where we may have different responsibilities and access, but a common vision towards liberation? Uh, and that refocus means that we're not saying that elections are the end goal. I will say early in my career, I was taught, let's do voter registration, let's do turnout, let's change the dynamics. Because in Colorado, before I was elected, it was super majorities of Republicans. Uh, all constitutional officers were Republicans. So we, let's just win majorities and that will be enough. Um, but elections actually aren't the end goal. So we need to refocus our horizon towards equitable implementation of policy. And at its core, it means that governance is a condition of how we engage with each other. For me, that is not revolutionary or new. That is the historic aspect of governance about how neighbors treat neighbors, about how communities, indigenous practice see the world, right? Like for me, this is at our core. 
can we do things together that improve our lives? Simple. And if we can hold that collaborative governance really and refocus towards this view that it's about what we can do together, um, then we're holding the view of the power of the tools in front of us. Is it allocating millions of dollars towards affordable housing or making sure that folks aren't being you know, deported out of our communities or that we don't have institutions that cause continual harm and violence? That's what we're doing, right? Like that's the focus. And when we continually refocus there, it puts us, I think, on the same page and allows us to say, what tactics do you have available to you? What power do you have inside or outside that we should move? The second thing I said is recommit. Um, so for me, again, I'm going to root in my own experience as an organizer turn elected official. There was a sense, let's get people elected. They'll do the good work and I will walk away as soon as they're elected. <laughs> but we have to recommit to democracy. To, I'm going to say this again. We have to recommit to democracy as a practice central to the health of our communities. And it's not just democracy is voting. It is showing up and finding ways to create new pathways for our voices to be heard. That means being present in, in you know, the official hearings that happen in the state legislature or in city council chambers. But it means legislators really commit to democracy as a practice. You're not just there to represent everyone. You actually have to do the hard work of governance of showing up back in your communities. I heard Gail and Helen really talk about this. And Crystal's organizing work is paramount here, right? But it looks functionally different when we are sharing power. Uh, I'll give an example. I worked on driver's licenses for undocumented folks when I was in Colorado's legislature. Um, one of the most difficult conversations about strategy happened at 10.30 p.m. at a local bar where myself and now Colorado State Senator Julie Gonzalez went to talk to the small organizing committee of immigrant rights folks who had been gathered around uh, the state. They showed up after state legislative sessions, after they put their kids to bed, and they were angry that the governor was actually pushing back on the the licenses issue. We had to talk strategy. We had to talk about negotiation. We had to talk about policy choices. And it was heated. It's 1030 at night in a bar. Like we shouldn't have been fighting over the details of policy, but that's where folks could be at that time, right? That's what we had to do. We had to change the conditions of how people got information. They were hearing real-time updates that I was hearing inside the Capitol. And then there were changes in strategy. But we have to recommit to this idea that we are in relationship with each other. Democracy is the constant practice of struggle. And so if if there's a standard of leadership that says, let's elect people, let's send them into chambers just to vote yes or no, or just to give a good speech, that is an F. <laughs> that is not the passing grade of public leadership. Um, and similarly, we can't say, let's send those folks off alone into those chambers and not reimagine that there's a need for us to show up in every space that they're in to push, to demand, to create new conditions of success, right? That's what we mean by collaborative governance. Finally, I'll say, this is something I hear frequently from the legislators I work in, uh, with our within our network across the country, it's to reimagine. Um, legislators, especially those of us who come from the communities which we're representing, came out of organizing, step into these positions, and there's a lot of hopes thrust upon our shoulders. Uh, and there's a lot of reconciliation repair that has to happen because we are working within systems that have historically harmed, um, caused violence within our communities. And so we can't just go in and say, hey, we're here now and everything's fine. In fact, we have to reimagine the systems of power and push really hard. Um, I think for that view, we need to say there's a fundamentally different way that we connect into reckoning with those systems of harm, changing those systems, because we now have our hands on power. That's great, Jesse. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Holly in just a minute um, to kick off with some more questions. I'm also going to use this opportunity to remind people that you can submit your own questions using the Q&A feature, um, and we'll have moderators who are monitoring the Q&A and fielding questions to the speakers through Holly. Um, but I want to ask one more um, sort of uh, trying to be a little bit provocative question before we jump into Holly. Um, I think we've talked a lot about kind of like how collaboration can help us build power. I'd love to hear like, what are some of its limitations? Like where has like, like this is something we're working on together. It is really hard. <laughs> um, and we are constantly trying to make strategic decisions in a complicated environment that is not neat, does not foster information sharing, trust, uh, relationship building, um, or any of the really nice things that we've just talked about. So if anyone wants to step in and just share sort of reflections on limitations, that would be great. And then Holly, maybe you can jump in um, and take it from there. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in and, and talk about it a little bit. And I, Jesse, I was really excited about everything that you said, because I feel like, um, you know, there's something really exciting that we're doing here in North Central Florida, which I think is going to lead to many more policy successes um, after all is said and done. You know, you talked about getting the right people elected. You, talk, you talked about collaboration. And, to, you know, to me, it's, you know, the, the governing power absolutely happens intentionally, strategically, and collaboratively. And recently in, you know, North Central Florida, I'm a former um, city commissioner, by the way, and I'm former because I recognize that this was much bigger than me and my like one or two dis dissenting, you know, one or two dissenting voices on the commission. Um, it really has to do with our, all the jurisdictions within our region, right? So city, county, school board, state, you know, working together. So what we're doing here is we're testing this kind of collaborative campaign model slash coalition building where we're, where we're making sure to recruit, train, and then, like you said, Jesse, support the candidates once we get them elected, making sure that everybody um, is beholden to, you know, certain principles that we're all deciding together and not just deciding together amongst ourselves, but as a coalition before the candidates even, you know, decide what their platform is. We're going out into the communities and doing issues-based canvassing. And that is what our platform is going to be. We're working with the organizers. We're making sure to recruit, you know, from the organizations. Um, and, and not only that, but the important piece of this that I want to mention is that we are absolutely working on, on pre-qualifying and, um, and, um, and pre-election um, policy. So what does this one, what does affordable housing mean, you know, across the city, state, school board, and, you know, soil and water? Does that mean that city and county are working together to make sure that we have land available for affordable housing? Does that mean that at the school board, they're going to set aside some money or some land to build workforce housing? What does that mean at the state level? You know, what kind of bill do you need to introduce to push forward kind of this regional, um, this regional effort towards affordable housing? So we're making sure that before we're even elected, because we're in a sunshine state, so we're not going to be able to do that after we're elected, that we absolutely are, are, are very aware of the policies that we need to bring forward once we're elected that work across all the jurisdictions at one time with everybody that hopefully gets elected um, from the progressive coalition that we're forming. So this work starts um, not just when we're elected, like you said, Jesse, but before that with the people on the ground informing the, the issues and informing the policies and then getting elected and then making sure to implement that. And I believe, uh, you know, personally, this is going to be the wave of, of, um, of, of coalition building and getting candidates elected in the future. Like, we cannot continue to do the same things that we're doing and, and, and continue to lose. Like, this absolutely needs to be collaboration, absolutely needs to be coalition, absolutely needs to be resource sharing and policy sharing ideas. So that's what I'd like to um, offer to the conversation. Thanks. That's wonderful. And this is such an honor. Thank you all so much. Oh, Helen, I was just going to bring you in and Crystal as well. I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting here is kind of this feedback loop mechanism that you all are talking about, thinking through sort of before an election, then the election itself. And then Jesse, I loved your sort of equitable implementation of policy. And so I want to I want to bring um, Helen and Crystal and Jesse and everyone in to kind of tease this out a little bit more and to think about also where are their trade offs, I think, kind of underscoring what Sarah was saying around these tensions of power. You know, one of the things that I hear a lot is in this conversation, OK, the co governance is great, but what is in and what's out. And so I think getting a real sense from all of you of places where you've seen those tensions would be great. So thank you all. Sure. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, <clears throat> if we are doing our work right, uh, we are running ahead of political moments that we're currently in. And that's largely because the political moment and the political realities are monstrous for many of our people. They result in massive deportations. Philadelphia being the highest evicting city, one of the highest evicting cities in the nation. Um, they result in children being taken away from their parents or schools closing down. So the political realities of the current situation are devastating. And as I said, if our work is right, we're running ahead of a political moment that we're in. But there are times when we're doing that work where um, there's no question that there's just tremendous risk. And I think Gail kind of touched on some of that. There's a lot of uncertainty about what lies ahead. Um, there are questions about uh, what 
we might have uh, politically, you know, within our corner um, from an outside perspective versus an inside perspective. Um, when the when your fellow, uh, you know, council members are the voting entity, um, sometimes it becomes difficult when they become the target. Um, and so you need to massage and work through some of these uh, questions and issues. Um, and then I think one of the hardest things to do is to, you know, pull people together, uh, those who are most risk within a political moment, and then those who are running as fast as they can to like, you know, pull us out of this thing, um, to really like continually be in deep conversation about strategies, um, approaches, disagreements in particular. Um, you know, we've had like a lot of heart to heart with our community members um, when we disagreed. Um, and there have been situations like, you know, when we were stopped in our eviction work by the municipal courts, I needed to see a change in the municipal court leadership. That was terrifying to a number of our advocates who can't be out front on doing that kind of work. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, that needs to be done. And then I think the second thing is, and this is also very important, there is a difference between external actors who are galvanizing for larger movements that exceed, expand, and are very long-term. They exceed any election. Um, and those who are in government, who are, you know, for for better or worse, you know, with without any kind of like, despite your best uh, desires, you are beholden to a political, you know, like world of that of that time. And so our language is not the same and does not have to be the same. Um, the things that we're shooting for are not the same. I will not curtail um, a movement that that needs to go far beyond uh, this political moment that we're in. I'm not going to stop people from saying like that's improper or that's not what we say or behavior modifying um, the work of activists that are profoundly important because fundamentally we have to change the mindset of what's even possible um, right now. And um, that is so much limited by our language, by our rhetoric and by the stories of what we hear by not allowing, I think Crystal said this really beautifully, the reason why we invest in town halls and listening sessions and building out collaborative tables is because the number of options before us are determined by the number of people that we bring to that table. If you have only a certain set of individuals at the table, all of whom are beholden to existing systems, your options are extraordinarily limited. And when we massively expand the table, we massively expand those options. But at the same time, we have to recognize our worlds are different and um, elected officials cannot get hung up on, you know, wanting to behavior modify um, immigrant activists who abolish ICE or defund the police. Um, there is profoundly important work that is done at that level that cannot um, be seen as a threat uh, within. Um, but those of us who are in government have to figure out how to navigate that um, internally as well. And so I think that's some of the areas, um, you know, that make it a challenge because we are here to change this political reality. We're not here to keep it fixed. Yeah, and I mean, I, I wanted to speak a little bit to this question and the prior one in that I think one of the limitations and, and some of the work that we still need to do together that really helps mitigate some of then those tensions is we have to do more work on power mapping our local governance institutions and understanding the opportunities and the systems changes that we can make. I mean, that is something that I think we are starting to uncover at different levels, like within the bail system and judicial system in Texas. And it's been eye-opening what we can do at different points and intersections. But I think we need to do that together with our leaders in um, and their staff, right, in governance and have that shared vision because then we know 
where we're headed together, you know, two years, five years, 10 years down the line, the things that we need to shift and change. And because we would be operating off of the same map, then it, then we understand the roles we have to play and when decisions need to get made and, and why, right? And so I think that's a critical part. And, and then there just has to be full transparency and authentic relationships along the way. And that's from both sides. And I think those are, those are new things that we're learning to do together when our executive director walks in to city council and we, you know, we just, we say it, we're, we're going to go after you in this way and, and it's okay, right? Like this is what we need to do. And we're going to have your back on the next thing, or you're going to have to have our back on, the, you know, we just, we have to be willing to just be upfront. Um, it isn't a game, even though it feels like it sometimes it really is all about transparency and relationships. And so I think that is something that we just have to keep remembering. And again, I think um, starting from a place of a real shared vision of where we need to go is a, is a strong foundation for that. I couldn't agree more, Crystal. I think I wanna give some context to some examples of what we mean, especially the tensions between governance and protesting and like when you're pulled in and pulled out, what does that look like? Uh, for me, there were some very specific things I presumed as an organizer that I felt very different about when I was elected official. Um, I thought that any kind of disagreement on policy was a lack of values alignment. But then I got to be an elected official and realized sometimes there are disagreements in policy that are super technical that I didn't fully comprehend. And it wasn't for lack of values alignment. It was actually some technical limitations of bureaucracy. I'll give an example. We modernized Colorado's election system. Uh, it was a huge undertaking. Now we have one of the highest voter participation rates in the country. Wonderful. When I started, the DMV was using DOS operating systems, green screens, like we had no technology, right, to even do motor voter registry. It was just madness. And when I started, we, I was telling some of the election advocates, like, we can't do the thing you want yet. And they're like, oh, you must be terrible. You don't support the vision. It's like, I support the vision. We're just working with computers from 1984, right? Like there's a little bit of that that we have to acknowledge. And so the limitations of bureaucracy really do matter when you're governing. Literally the computer system sometimes or the amount of staff on the floor to process housing applications or you know the kinds of things that actually make government work. And so when there's disagreements in policy, there needs to be that level of trust that Crystal was talking about both directions. Uh, it is you know, organizers saying, we're going to push you hard on X because we don't think you're there on the issue. That's totally true. And legislators sometimes have to communicate the real honest information about the vulnerabilities of our systems or the limitations of bureaucracy and how they may not fully achieve the vision of our movements. Um, I'm really proud of some of the work that happened in Nevada this year with our state director, um, really looking at full range of access uh, for Indigenous folks in Nevada around voting. Um, they did a statewide res tour with four different affiliated sovereign tribes to talk about the kinds of access issues in rural communities. It was lack of broadband. It was lack of connection to post office service. A whole host of real technical limitations of government that were keeping native communities from full voter participation. Without that kind of deep and collaborative view, the election administrators were unclear about what kind of policy changes were even needed because they didn't have the lived experience. That's a little bit of what we have to do. I think the other part here is protesting can and should happen. It should always continue. It is kind of baked into our organizing ethos across the board. At the same time, it has to be done with a level of trust. And this is why what Gail said about before people are even running, you're building these relationships trusts, you, you know, establish them during the time they run. And then afterwards, because sometimes there's really important information inside that needs to inform the outside strategies. Uh, I remember there was a, a Republican leader blocking a bunch of legislation I was working on, was privately communicating that to the governor. I knew the inside dynamics, outside groups I had shared, hey, this is the person who's blocking some of the work that we want to move. And the outside groups decided to protest the governor, who was actually in line with us, pissed off the governor instead of actually going after our target, who was the real barrier uh, when, we were, when I was serving in the minority. It's those kinds of things that really can limit our strategy and our potential. And I totally understand there's a lack of trust sometimes when we don't have the full view of information. But this is where we need to do something that I want to echo a, a mentor, or a friend of mine, uh, Mo Mitchell, he's the head of the Working Families Party. He says we need to um, pull the sum of our parts into the strength of a fist. 
and know that in fact, someone inside might have really important information that can shape a protest strategy that will be much more impactful. Um, it's not always gonna be right, but the more we can do that, the better refined our options are and we get to the right kind of power outcomes. Well, this is such a rich conversation. I wish, you know, we could chat all day, but we are all, everyone is doing such amazing work on the ground. Um, so I'm just going to share a few kind of things I'm hearing, and then we're going to open it up to the Q&A. And thank you all for putting your questions in the Slido. Uh, they're really amazing. I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's sort of like a pyramid thinking about how do we start centering with people, place, and power and creating those mechanisms, particularly for traditionally marginalized communities to have a voice and to have a say, but then understanding all the machinery, the bureaucratic limitations, Jesse, that you mentioned, I think that was really illustrating. Crystal, your point about sort of the power mapping, that the ecosystem analysis, understanding where all of these relationships fit. And then Helen and Gail, you've provided these really rich examples of this on the ground. So I'm gonna turn it over and just share a few questions that we're hearing from the audience. Um, what examples can the panel leaders share moving beyond urban focus successes of co-governance to heavily rural, less dense population centers, and this idea of community cultivators, which was such a great thing. So I loved that, Gail, flipping the consultancy model on its head. Uh, maybe we can speak a little bit more about the kind of government benefits to the community as well, and maybe some of the tools out there. So why don't we start with those? And there's, there's so many rich things here. Thank you all so much. Um, I know I'm technically a facilitator, but I can't help myself to jump in on the first one. So I'm just going to do it to open us up. Um, I think, you know, like I grew up in New York City politics um, and like many people that grew up in a professional world predominantly shaped by like the you know, beautiful egocentrism of New York. I spent my first several years at Local Progress, like unlearning everything I learned about New York City being the center of the universe. Um, so I wanna share an example from our Local Progress chapter in New York, which is, you know, 175 around elected officials from municipalities, large, small, medium-sized, rural, suburban, all across the state um, who work together collectively. And um, that work has been really transformative for me because coming in with this very like New York centric, New York City centric thing, it was like a huge shock to me when I first started to do that work to see how changes that we were fighting for for like decades in New York City could pass in Albany, up and down the Hudson Valley, in Newburgh, New York, in small towns and smaller communities. So, you know, for example, some of the most controversial police reform bills that were being debated in New York City in 20, you know, 13, 14, 15 passed in Albany and in Kingston, New York before they passed and passed in stronger form in those places than they did in New York City. Um, the work to move just cause protections for evictions has now moved in like half a dozen municipalities across New York State. And, you know, I think when we talk a little bit about, I think we're all like, as kind of organizers and people who want to build power, we're often thinking about scale and the scale of our impact. Um, but I think examples like this really show the kind of promise of innovating policy in smaller jurisdictions. And when we go back to the complexity of the bureaucracy, the workforce challenges, like those actually look really different in smaller cities, right? In smaller municipalities where you're not talking about 5,000 workers, you might be talking about 50 or 10. Um, and so, you know, you really can experiment with uh, bureaucratic change in ways that I think often is outside of the grasp of bigger cities where there's more defended interest, there's more contentious politics, um, and there can be greater barriers to experimentation. You know, we have seen like the cities of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, and Ithaca, New York pilot some of the most like sort of comprehensive strategies around reimagining public safety and decentering policing. Those are not big cities, right? Those are 40,000 people, 50,000 people um, really trying to think about what is that, uh, what is innovation that is in line with our values look like at that scale. So, you know, I think that just um, is a couple examples from kind of our broader work at Local Progress. I'll add a bit here too from a rural perspective with state legislators and maybe to challenge um, 
an assumption that folks might be working with for this conversation. You don't have to be in a political majority to move policy or resource. And collaborative governance doesn't just happen when you have, you know, all of the political power. You can actually engage in these key components and move policies or resource uh, when you're organizing, right, in community. And I want to give an example. This year, uh, the State Innovation Exchange, the organization I'm a co-executive director of, hosted a um, a strategy session on the Justice for Black Farmers Act that was being introduced in the U.S. Senate and worked with uh, Black legislators all across the country to introduce policies, including in states where there were no governing majorities. I want to highlight in Georgia, um, Senator Kim Jackson was able to work by organizing Black farmers in rural areas and connecting them to the policy ideas that were central there, including land uh, reparations and uh, really investing in communities. By doing the front end work of organizing across rural communities to talk about the specific and historical impacts of racism on black farmers, um, that kind of organizing work then built a clear sense of what the needs were. So when the ARP funding came down by state, Senator Kim Jackson was ready to actually deploy resources aligned with that vision connected to rural communities based on a vision of reparation in Georgia. Right, like, so this is what we mean. Like you can actually lead and be prepared for moments, even if you're not in a governing majority, you can be bold in your advocacy as legislators and movement actors alike. And it's because you're cultivating the relations of trust. So when the moments arise, um, you can move. If you have political power, it's a lot easier to move a lot, thing, a lot of things more quickly, but we shouldn't abdicate the idea that you can be in a proactive forward stance when you're serving in a political minority. In fact, that's some of the ways that we see a lot of states innovating in policy and moving great stuff. Um, without, you know, a full political majority. That's great. Do others want to jump in on this question? Okay, well, there was another question that I thought would be really interesting for this group, and maybe um, Helen, Gail, Crystal, if you want to jump in. Research shows recent voters feeling decreases in their agency, the ability to make positive change in their community through engagement. What do you suggest? <laughs> Helen, you want to start us off? Um, yeah, you know, I, I I don't think there's any question that part of the work, um, especially being a local elected official, is to really get um, on the ground and show that um, if you participate, if you can engage, and if you persist through, things change. It's not that you just say it or you're shoring people up, but you have to prove it. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest tasks. When we, uh, when I first came into city council, um, we had closed down almost 30 public schools and lost thousands of educators, including most of our nurses and counselors out of schools. Um, we held a series of town halls with more than 2,500 Philadelphians when we were under a state takeover um, and didn't control uh, you know, a school board. We didn't have a local school board um, and, you know, there were no resources, but an overwhelming turnout of Philadelphians demanding nurses and counselors meant that nurses and counselors actually came back into our schools the following September with not a significant change in resources with the same leadership of the school district. The thing that had changed was not them. The thing that had changed was us. It was our belief that we could not let the intolerable last one day longer. It was committing ourselves to a process that would take time. Um, and recognizing that while it doesn't have to happen overnight, it does have to happen within a time frame that you can count um, that can make a difference in a child's life, you know? And so, um, you know, that only launched more things through. Uh, we have school board meetings that that can last for hours on end now because there's so many people engaged. And now I think one of the things that we have to remind ourselves of is that as we get better, systems get better at refuting us. Um, and so our processes need to change. Our strategies need to get smarter. The people who show up need to diversify. Um, and that what we're really conscious of is that the things that threaten us um, from coming together are not so much the forces that are external. They are forces that are internal within movements. It can be patriarchy, misogyny, um, anti-trans hate, anti-blackness, um, you know, a lang a, you know, language that alienates, pushes away, or tries to once again centralize power 
within movements whose only power is more people. Um, and so, you know, I think that part of uh, this work is to really show that something can be done and not to talk about it. And that is why I'm so committed to groups like Local Progress, um, to the people on this call, because we're trying to show every day that in the face of the most dangerous thing in the world, which is the idea that nothing ever changes, um, that when we take bold action together, systems topple. And sometimes we can be there to watch it all happen and be part of it. And so I hope that that gives people some courage and uh, some faith. I'll jump in here for a minute. Thanks, Helen. Um, just to piggyback off of what you said is that the reason why people feel like their voices aren't being heard and that their, um, and that their input is not being considered is because many times it is not. And I think at the very outside, like with that feedback loop, we're missing an important piece of that, um, that we as anybody that can influence this need to be committed to. And that means telling people at the beginning what their feedback will do and how it's gonna impact the outcome. So if you have a panel with someone, we need to follow up or we invite people to the table to talk about you know, how, what the, how their voices will impact you know, policy we need to be incredibly intentional from the outset to say, this is how it's going to impact the outcome and then come back to the people to say, this is how your feedback impacted the outcome. And that is what is missing most of the time. So if we, as people that are, you know, have the ability to impact that can do that from the outset, I think that that will give people um, continued kind of energy and hope to continue to um, to take part in the process and be a part of the civic engagement that we need. And I wanted to lift up, we lift up some of the examples that Gail gave earlier around the organizing work that they're doing um, and really going out there and capturing people's voices. I mean, I think the pandemic has taught us, you know, to we we've been forced to restructure how we organize and how we engage. And I think that's opened the door to many more opportunities of meeting people where they are in this challenging time to have the conversations with them about what their needs are, what their priorities are, how they can tap into government and into these decisions. And so I think we need to be thinking about TikTok and all of the different, you know, all of those different technical resources that we have now and how we convert that into real um, energy and feedback. And then I think just for, for those that are already in government and even elected officials who sit in safe districts that sit on resources that they don't really use, give that back into community organizations to have conversations. The vaccine money has been given to organizations in Harris County to talk to folks about the vaccine, but to also talk to them and ask them ask community members questions about what's happening to your family right now. What are your priorities? What are the things that you need? So we need to think about that reallocation of resources so that we've got money in the community to knock on doors and have those conversations. I just wanna remind us all um, and the folks listening that we've survived a pandemic or surviving a pandemic, an insurrection, um, a lot of isolation. And so um, despair and hopelessness are designed outcomes of our current reality. It is up to us to inspire hope and to challenge a view of what's possible and I think it's incredibly important that for folks who are feeling disillusionment with their power to remind them that um, all of the things that we aspire to are possible and especially possible at the local and state level. We've been talking about free college, states have been implementing. If we're talking about protecting immigrant families, cities are innovating. Um, if we're looking at the big changes happening at the federal government, most of those come out of state and local policy first, right? So the ways that we change the world happen in our closest proximity of power and influence that's our neighborhoods, that's our people, that's where it starts. Well, what a perfect way to end. I am so grateful to all of you, Sarah. It has been so fun co-moderating. Big thank you to all of our panelists, such an inspiration. Thank you for the collaboration, local progress, the Forge, the New America events team, and a reminder that there are links to the Forge publication on co-governance and our recent New America political reform publication as well. Thank you all, wishing everyone